Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever in the world you may be joining us from today. My name is Francesco Del Carpio, and I am the CFL York Operations Coordinator. I would like to officially open the first session of the Climate Change Displacement Dialogue, presented in partnership with the Center for Refugee Studies at York University, York Emergency Mitigation, Engagement, Response, and Governance Institute, CFL Philippines, the University of the Philippines Resilience Institute, and Antelaya Billam University. I would like to begin today's session with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge and recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territory upon which our campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. The area is known as Tecoronto and has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and that the territory is subject to the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. As this is an online event, our participants may be joining from various locations, so I strongly encourage you to learn about the traditional land upon which you are located. With this, I welcome our moderator, our speaker, and our participants from around the world. Welcome to our webinar. For those who may not be familiar with CFL York, our center was established in 2020 and started its operations in 2021. CFL York was created in collaboration between the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, or UNITAR, and York University with York Region to develop and deliver training and knowledge sharing, as well as capacity building programs across five focus areas, which are disaster risk, emergency management, and humanitarian actions, health, development, environment, and climate change, entrepreneurship, digital technology, and economic development, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and advancing the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It is now my great pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Nilanjana Ganguly. Nilanjana, or Nell Ganguly, is a PhD candidate at the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change at York University. Her work employs an intersectional systems thinking and participatory approach to develop strategies for improving health resilience among women engaged in transactional sex in Malawi's gendered natural resource economies, particularly in the Lake Chilwa Basin. Nell holds a master's degree in environmental studies and a bachelor's in biotechnology from York University. From 2022 to 2024, Nell served as the project manager for the Dadale Institute's complex adaptive modeling of the health impacts of climate change in Malawi project. She currently contributes as a graduate research assistant and grant writer for the Malawi team and volunteers as a grant manager for the leadership of environment and development, Southern and Eastern Africa. Nell, thank you very much for moderating today's session. The floor is yours. Thank you, Francesco. Um, thank you everyone for joining us on this inaugural session of our Climate Change Displacement and Dialogue series. Uh, we've been planning it for a few months so, and I'm quite excited to, um, you know, to, to, uh, to kickstart this event with Dr. Yvonne Su, who will be um, discussing, who will be presenting how climate migration and displacement are shaping policy responses globally and enable us to gain a nuanced understanding of climate frontiers as spaces for innovation um, and transformative policy interventions. Uh, her presentation is titled Redefining Climate Frontiers, Migration, Displacement, and Global Resilience. Uh, before I introduce Dr. Sue, I wanted to quickly go over some um, housekeeping rules. So this is a one hour session. Um, Yvonne will present for about 40 minutes, uh, following which we'll have a brief Q&A session. I will facilitate the Q&A session, so please drop in your questions in the chat box, the Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and finally, um, Francesco will end the session with closing remarks sharply at one. The session is being recorded, uh, and the content will be available on the CFAL website, if I'm not wrong, Francesco. Uh, and we welcome you uh, to revisit the content yourself and share it with colleagues. So now let me introduce Dr. Yvonne Su. I feel quite proud doing this. Um, so Dr. Yvonne Su is the director of the Center for Refugee Studies. Her research is on forced migration, climate change, induced displacement, and queer migration. She has worked extensively with vulnerable communities in Southeast Asia and Latin America and the Caribbean and the Caribbeans, including refugees, asylum seekers, undocumented migrants, indigenous peoples, and LGBTQ plus communities. Her work has been cited by the international organizations like IPCC and International Organization of Migration. 
Yvonne has garnered over 8 million in research funding, including funding from NFRF and SHRC. Um, she takes an interdisciplinary, participatory, and decolonial approach to scholarship that is focused on developing strong partnerships with local communities, NGOs, and policymakers. Yvonne, without further ado, welcome again, and thank you for sharing your work with us. The stage is all yours. Thanks, Nell. It's so funny to hear you call me Dr. Yvonne Sue because you're my friend, too. <laughs> Everybody can call me Yvonne. <laughs> it's too formal. So I'm very excited for this um, a dialogue series overall and for my talk. I think the dialogue series is really important because we're reaching a point where there's so many new things happening in climate migration, climate mobility, displacement, yet a lot of people aren't necessarily caught up with the literature or the potential consequences of the, the various new initiatives or conversations or even concepts and terms that's taking place. So it's really nice to kind of come back and, and as a group and as scholars that are interested in this topic and kind of, you know, reshape it, and redefine it, um, bring more energy to it, but also ask some really hard questions and set an, a research agenda that hopefully is going to be more transformative. So um, let's get into it. So what I'm going to talk about and ask for today is a bolder, proactive, decolonial, as well as critical research agenda when it comes to climate migration. Not that it has not been before, but I feel like there's still a lot more we can do. And there are many actors on the international, national level that will push for such an agenda, but actually don't have the resources or the political will to make it happen. So as scholars, I feel like it's our responsibility to, to kind of keep pushing and ask for those things. We can start by saying that it's very timely. I mean, right now, it's climate week in New York. There are all these um, global leaders that are meeting. They just had the summit for the future, summit of the future um, take place. And they, you know, they produced a pack for the future. That's kind of the newest document coming out of the UN. Uh, and as I write, it addresses climate change as one of the great challenges of our time. There's a strong emphasis on the disproportional uh, disproportionate impacts that climate change is having on the global south and vulnerable communities. Uh, the Pact for the Future asks for urgent um, climate commitments, global temperature limit of 1.5 degrees warming, support for vulnerable communities and countries, uh, increase in climate finance, and a recognition of climate justice. Well, many of you who are have studied climate change for a long time will think that none of this is very new, and that is true. It is not very new, yet we have a new pact for the future. We have a new summit of the future, right? So it's recycling a lot of the same things and we have to be cautious of that as a academic community. We also have climate week. It's taking place right now and it's the biggest climate event bringing together thousands of people across 600 events. Uh, events. The who's who of scientists, business leaders and celebrities like Prince Harry are there. I like to add that I was invited to the Climate Mobility Summit, enabling people positive adaptation journeys, but I declined so I could be here with you guys. All right, so let's keep going. One of the reasons why it's also extremely timely to talk about this is that the media will not quit with very alarmist rhetoric about climate migration. This is, was published in 2022 by The Guardian, the century of climate migration, why we need to plan for the great upheaval. Just that headline alone gives people this idea that we can't control it. There is this these masses of people coming. They're going to overtake us. It's 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 frightening. It's fear mongering. And it's it's, of course, on purpose. And if you read the highlighted section, it says large populations will need to migrate and not simply to the nearest city but also across continents. Again, that's, that's just very fear-mongering. Those living in regions with more tolerable conditions, especially in nations in the global, sorry, in the Northern latitudes, will need to accommodate millions of migrants while themselves adapting to the demands of climate crisis. We will need to create entirely new cities near the planet's cooler poles in land that is rapidly becoming ice-free. Parts of Siberia, for example, are already experiencing temperatures of 30 degrees Celsius um, for months at a time. While some of these aspects are true, we need to also put it within context and not sensationalize. So it's, it's, a, it's a very challenging tightrope that needs to be walked. 
where we recognize the challenges of climate change and climate migration and the consequences of it, and we recognize that it disproportionately impacts the global south, but we don't say that they're all coming and they're all coming to North America and Europe, because that's not true. Statistically, empirically, that's just not true. And, and I'll, I'll explain that after I, I touch on the New York Times Magazine, which talked about how uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of Guatemalans fled north towards the United States, right? And with Trump and his really anti-immigrant, anti-migrant, xenophobic, racist, sensationalized rhetoric, you know, people read that and it is very frightening, right? This imagery, these imageries that he paints uh, causes people to panic and have a very adverse reactions, very allergic reactions to migrants, asylum seekers and refugees. And again, this is not true. The trends that we've been seeing is south to south migration. A significant of my, amount of migration that's happening in the continent of Africa is within the continent of Africa, right? Asia, other places, people are moving internally within their own countries or across to their neighbors because it makes sense. It costs so much fun money to fly. Uh, there are significant amounts of visa restrictions, paperwork. They don't have social capital, right? They don't have people in other places that can easily help them integrate. If you have a small family, you have to Think about uprooting your small family, getting them into schools, language programs, healthcare. It's, it's a significant amount that has to be done to move. Or, or that's just the simple impact of you leaving family members behind. Perhaps you're leaving elderly parents behind. There's the, the human aspect of all this is completely overlooked. And we treat them as these waves and, and floods and economic units that are moved. But really, at the heart of this is still people. And the statistics tell us they move south to south. There's actually more south to south migration that's happening now in the last years and into the future than there is south to north. So I cannot express that point further, that any future research on this really has to keep that in mind so we don't continue to perpetuate these really sensational narratives that we see places like The Guardian and New York Times Magazine perpetuating. And this is going to continue easily into the future. But I wanna bring you back a bit because historically, it's also happened. This is not new. So in 2007, the Christian aid organization came up with a report called Human Tide. Again, frightening. And you've reduced people to waves and tides, but also the scary imagery of a bunch of people kind of overtaking you or piling on you. It, it's, it's horrible imagery. The real migration crisis. Now, the issue with this report was that and, and, I, and it was, this was part of my uh, master's thesis at Oxford, and I got to speak with uh, one of the main uh, authors of this. Um, and the issue with this report was he said to me, we try to use climate migration, climate refugees, which was very sexy at the time. This was very vogue. Everybody was writing about it because it was quite new. Uh, and again, quite alarmist. We, he's, he told me, we try to use climate refugees as the way to draw attention to the real migration crisis, which is very unsexy, which is internal displacement, which continues to be a completely overlooked aspect. People really seem to only care when people move across borders. So any type of internal migration due to conflict or famine is, is really overlooked. And migration scholars know this. But what the mistake was in doing this kind of bait and switch was that people didn't switch. They took the bait and they completely misunderstood. So a big number that came out was that there would be a billion climate refugees. So this report meant to say there was gonna be a billion people displaced by 2050, but people misread, people wanted to sensationalize and it became there would be a billion climate refugees by 2050. And you know, to almost 20 years on, I am still correcting people on this misconception because it's so sticky. Right, this this idea that there's a billion climate refugees. So you know, in 2014, I wrote uh, this article in response to it, the one billion climate refugees that never was. How INGOs and um, human rights, uh, sorry, adding an INGO human rights perspective to climate induced migration. And then a few years later, I almost felt that maybe we went too far against climate refugees because uh, Francois Jamin, who's a leading author on climate refugees, kind of talks about the fact that if we don't consider them as refugees, we don't put the words climate refugees together, we're overlooking the hugely political reasons why people are moving. 
and that po the political choices that are being made, being made by actors, political actors, do not address climate change, to leave those who are most vulnerable vulnerable. Uh, and therefore, he's making an argument that that the neglect of action on climate change is also a form of persecution that people are facing. The conversation has since moved on, but it's important to highlight the, the history of it. It's, it's not. Oh, sorry. So the other thing is, as I mentioned, the climate migration debate and research has moved leaps and bounds in the last 20 years. And I think some people aren't caught up because they really get really focused on the, the label of refugees versus not refugees or migrants, et cetera. That's very important, but also being held up in that debate is, is not so useful academically. And it really stops us from doing the empirical research and the really messy research. Because if you think about it, that's kind of easy to talk about, refugees or migrants. It's very rhetoric level, it's very discourse, but the messiness happens on the ground. So we've got this beautiful kind of diagram that was created. This is from the Foresight Report. Uh, Richard Black was the, well, I think the main person that was writing this. A lot of other um, authors as well, like I said, from uh, Francois Germain. Um, and they talk about how, um, um, climate migration, climate mobility is multi-causal, right? Uh, environment, political, demographic, economic, social factors uh, play a role in people's decision to move. And there is the influence of environmental change as a driver overall. So climate change is the big umbrella that influences all these other factors. And then you move over and there's the decision. There's the personal household characteristics that might impact someone's decision. There's intervening obstacles like the political legal frameworks, like I said, visas, cost of moving, finances, social networks, like I talked about, diasporic links, recruitment agencies, technology, et cetera, et cetera. So there's many things that come into the decision. And then, you know, at the point of this, which was created, uh, I think, 10 years ago, oh uh, no, yeah, 10 years ago, sorry, 10 years ago, um, they, they kind of stayed with just going um, whether the decision was going to be to migrate or to stay. So they kind of just flowed this way. So the, a lot of research has been done on this and, and it's great. However, a lot of questions remain, especially on the fuzzy side, right? So I think it's great that we had worked out this diagram, but this part is continual, continues to be underdeveloped, right? So for example, and it's also not uh, problematized. I think that's also really important. So what are th what about those who migrate, right? They decide to migrate, but then they return and then they migrate again, right? It's very dynamic. It's not just migrate or stay. It's not so simple. It's not so dichotomous. Uh, we're very complicated beings. We get confused. We change our mind. Things happen back home or opportunities come up. And it's it's not just migrate or stay. What about those who stay, but again, migrate internally? Internal migration continues to be overlooked. So, so how, how where, what is, what is the, you know, radius of stay, right? Is do we really just mean in their own homes? Oh, hello. <laughs> did you get confetti as well? <laughs> or did, I'm too excited for Zoom. <laughs> or uh, do we mean like uh, within a city, or maybe to uh, rural to urban, right? Does that all mean stay? I'm not sure. And how do climate migrants or people themselves uh, experience stay? And of course, what about those who are trapped? We have a lot of trapped populations who don't have, uh, as a result, again, all these various aspects on the right-hand side of the uh, diagram because of their sex, because of their lack of education, or because of their marital status or religion, ethnicity, language skills are forced to stay, as well as because of the legal frameworks, cost of living, et cetera. So there's a lot more to explore uh, in terms of this side of the diagram. But the other thing that's really important and, and uh, the main meat of my presentation is new climate frontiers. So climate migration, as I discussed, it's complicated, it's non-linear, it's multi-locational, it's circular or repetitive, it's north to south, it's also south to south, like I said. It's not just about vulnerability and resilience. I know those are the really core concepts within our studies, but those narratives are both harmful, sorry, both helpful and they're harmful. And, and a lot of people have really caught up to the harmful aspect of it, but I think we just need more nuance, more dynamic, more critical conversations about this because it's not just harmful and just helpful. Right, they interplay, they intersect, uh, and it's actually quite complicated depending on the context that we're looking at. Uh, of course, and also the level, we're looking at the international level, national level, regional, local, right? So it plays a different role in all the various aspects. 
And then there, and then most importantly, I want to say that the new frontiers are things that happen in between, right? Either the levels or in between the types of migration. Uh, they're often invisible, uh, whether it be something along the lines of, of gender or ethnicity or religion. There's aspects that are not so visible uh, and often unintentional. We're entering a space where a lot of our solutions lead to unintended consequences and sometimes lead to further displacement. Yet we're not, our research isn't there yet. We're so focused on the solutions uh, and, and, and in a way maybe propaganda forces us to think about the positive impacts, especially when it comes to uh, resettlement and climate uh, adaptation that our brains don't lead us to the often unintended consequences. And, and lastly, I think if they're unintended, it's really hard to know as scholars the right questions to ask, you know, and people on the ground, because oftentimes they're not going to be up to date with the with the newest types of programs. And unfortunately, uh, it's very common to go to places that have had climate adaptation projects, and they don't even know that a climate change adaptation project took place in their own communities. So how do we under how can we understand unintended consequences? when of course they are unintended. And as scholars without the local context, sometimes we don't know necessarily the right questions to ask to unearth those. So we'll start with one of the biggest kind of questions that are most important to ask when it comes to climate migration. And one of our other speakers in our series, Dr. Erica Bauer from uh, Stanford will be addressing this in a later seminar. So look out for that when we advertise it. So these questions are, how can we do plan relocation well? How can we do it in a decolonial, dignified, and respectful manner? How do we avoid the traps of disaster capitalism? So for any prospective PhD students or even master's students or anybody looking for a new project, plan relocation is very challenging to study. One, because uh, it's in the future, right? Many people, when they think about disaster, when the disasters in the context of climate change, they see the big ones happening in the future. Or when it comes to sea level rise, everybody uses the year 2050. So as I say sometimes, it's a future of on problem, right? It's a problem that's going to take place in the future. And it's really hard to, to cast our mind into the future and figure out how to do it. It's also an extremely sensitive topic. Plan relocation is literally the, the relocation of whole communities to other places. And in the context of small and states, they often have to leave their ancestral grounds. All of their history, all of their people are on these islands and we're asking them to leave it in likely forever, right? So it's a really, really big deal. It, it brings up a lot of um, challenges, social conflict, uh, and, and again, something that, that I often bring up because it really touches the nerve of most people is, is it brings up the question of what do you do with the dead? What do you do with the graveyards, the gravestones, the bones of their ancestors? Imagine all of your history is in an island attached to a piece of land. Do you exhume uh, the bones and the, and, the, and the grave and bring it with you to the new site? Or do you let it wash into the sea? Whenever I ask my, my students this question, many are quick to say, well, I, I wouldn't want to, to, to exhume the bones. I, I wouldn't want to touch them. I, I would just let them wash in the sea. I think my ancestors would agree. And then I ask them, well, what if that was, you know, a recent family member of yours that passed, right? What if in your culture, you believe in ghosts as we do in Chinese culture, right? If I disrespect my ancestors, if I don't treat them well, the, I am told, and this is the belief that they will come and haunt me. So when you start to bring those aspects, and there's many cultures that have this, and, and, and that's, that's kind of where, you know, academia has these blind spots, right? We, we don't, we don't, we, those are the invisible parts that are extremely important that get overlooked. And this idea of a ghost and potentially all of your ancestors haunting you can be completely overwhelming and, and is a line many people will not cross. So they will have to do the hard work of exhuming the, the graves and removing them. Again, this is something that many of us might not think about because we don't have the cultural, uh, historical or local context. So we could be having a very top-down conversation and overlooking something really significant. Or even when it comes to plan relocation in the new place in the sense or, of designing it, you know, the, the graveyard, these places are really important. It's not just about the basic infrastructure because we're talking about the relocation of whole communities, not just the homes, not just people. 
So that's where it comes down to these questions of um, how do we move them in a dignified and respectful manner? We have to speak with the communities. We have to do the extremely hard and tedious work of community consultation. I think that gets brought up a lot, but having it done well and in advance and pilot testing everything is extremely challenging. And that often does not get done. So there can be consultations, but in terms of actually bringing the results back or working through plans, that part is often missing. So sure, they come and participate in a, a seminar or a workshop or a conversation or a focus group, but actually having them hear where their opinions went and where the other decisions are being made, that is very rare. And then there's the colonial aspect, because a lot of these people who are um, going to be relocated ha have a colonial history. They're in poor, uh, poorly environmentally situated places, often in the first place as a result of colonialism, right? Those were the pieces of land, especially if they're indigenous, that got given them, given to them by the state, and they're often already in um, not so environmentally sound places. So then you have the additional layer of of relocating them after you've actually relocated them in the first place. This happens in the in the Pacific. This also happens in um, in Canada as well. Now we're we running out of time already. We have we're halfway, so you have another oh twenty minutes. My gosh, guys. Okay, I will blaze. Doing good. You're doing good. As I've mentioned, um, Fiji is relocating. 42 villages inland, and as I mentioned, Dr. Erica Bauer, Dr. Beth Ferris, and Dr. Jamie McAdam and Calder Center are doing some amazing work on this, so please go check it out. And they're doing it in, a, and I would say, in quite a, a systematic, community consultation, thoughtful manner. And they're being quite proactive. Now, we've got another situation where it's more, I would argue, managed displacement or a potential disaster capitalism. So this is Tekloban City. This is a photo that I took in 2015 after Typhoon Haiyan in a place called Anabong. Uh, this community was heavily impacted, not just here, but along the shoreline, about 13 tanker ships came in and ran over these communities. Thousands died. And this is a photo I took just last month. And it's a, it's, you'll see the buildings are gone. And I have a short video where I can show you where I reflect on that experience. So I was here in 2015 and 2017 doing my PhD research, and this is a community in Tagloban um, after Typhoon Haiyan that was severely affected. Um, it, like most of the homes were destroyed. Like I don't know if you can see, but that's a big tanker ship, right? Uh, Thirteen of them washed up along the coast, and many of them hit this community called Anabong. But you can't really tell it's a community anymore because it's actually properly been demolished and removed. So the Philippines government created something called the No Build Zone. This is 40 kilometers from the coast. And you're not supposed to build here because, of course, it's dangerous or vulnerable to typhoons. These were these little stilts, these were all the bases, the foundations of, of homes that used to be up. Um, this is a, kind of a slum area. But anyways, um, and now they, they have properly demolished many of the homes. There's some informal settlers. Um, but that's that's displacement, relocation in action, and it is a bit devastating to see that there was a thriving community here, and as a result of a lot of um, hazards, but also government neglect in terms of um, making them more resilient or just preventative measures or disaster risk reduction, um, they're they're gone. Like like a whole thriving community, fisher folk used to be here, and now they're gone. So it was really emotional for me to be there because I was there and there were homes and there were people, there were communities, and then yeah, they're gone and they got real. Oh, oh, so I was here in twenty, and then they got relocated to resettlement sites that are about an hour away and very undeveloped. And it took it takes three to four different modes of transportation just to get there. You go on a bus and you go on uh, a tricycle, which is motorized, and then you go on a pedal bike. You know, it's it's really hard to get to. And these people get relocated to these places and they don't have water. They don't have electricity. It took many years, five to, six, five to eight years for communities to get potable wa water to the resettlement sites. So they have to wait for their weekly delivery of water from the city. And it's mostly women and children that just wait around for their water. Um, so what are the alternatives, right? Are there more people-centered approaches? So I would say the look, relocation in place. So this is an example of a home in Taiwan City that was just rebuilt exactly where it was. 
People don't like to do this. Organizations don't like to do this because it's much cheaper to find a piece of land elsewhere and that's completely flat and you just build a completely new community. Here you have to respect all of the old lines and old pipes and other things that were that were there before and it's more costly. Um, and also I think in a way it, it, it does not give the government the advantage of potentially repurposing these communities for hotels or again, disaster capitalism uh, for commercial areas because this often happens in coastal communities. And this is an example of a child-friendly approach. Um, Plan, uh, Plan Philippines was able to ask certain communities for them to help in planning how the, the new buildings were going to be painted. So the, so the children um, played a role in choosing the colors. So then houses were all green, schools were a certain color, and I think that was wonderful for them to see. There's also a, lively, a livelihoods first approach. So a lot of people that get displaced are fisher folk. So they get moved away from the coast where their livelihood is as fishermen and women, and they get pushed into um, an hour away inland. And one of the quotes that we got from our recent field work was, how do you make a fish live on land? So Giwan, which is a, a community that um, is four hours away from Tagloban, was also hit by Tag uh, Typhoon Haiyan, said that they're going to build uh, garages along the coast so that while you are not physically living there, your boats have a place to go that is safe. Because the fisher folk did not want to leave their boats just hanging out and people can steal them, people can break them. So there's specific garages that are built for them to house them so then they can commute. But also they have an idea that's I think really innovative, which is that the fisher folk who got displaced get first dibs on any um, commercial things that happen. So they get a fishing stall there that they used to have. So because just because they got relocated doesn't mean they lose their livelihood and they lose their access to livelihood. I think that's extremely innovative. And it also comes from just talking to the communities as opposed to making these top down um, projects. There's also the intentional and committed committed community consultations. So not just the ones that are just tokenized and the idea that you need to let communities prioritize where and how they relocate. So quickly, one of the examples is this idea that we just went here in the South of Philippines and it was really fascinating because they told us, the, the it was UN Habitat and the local, community, local municipality, they told us it was a culturally sensitive way to relocate the Bajau, which are seen as kind of like um, this community, this indigenous community, they're often described as mermen and mermaids because they can hold their um, uh, breath underwater for a very long time and fish um, in the sea spear fishing. So the I was told that it was culturally sensitive because currently a lot of them are displaced and they live in slum communities like the, the picture you see, which does not have good sanitation, um, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's, it's just not a great place for them to live in these slums. So they created these new equal villages and houses that are designed with their um, cultural and um, livelihood practices in mind. But when I asked them, Okay, so what are the climate change adaptation strategies? What are is the climate knowledge of the Bajau? The individual I was speaking with who was leading this process said, I don't know. And it floored me because this was supposed to be a so culturally sensitive project, but yet the Bajau were not actually really that consulted and their knowledge was not integrated. And I think that's a really um, common issue and the huge downside of top-down approaches. Right. These are actually still very top down approaches to relocation and resettlement and migration. And I'll quickly highlight that this happens at home as well. We talk a lot about climate migration abroad, but climate migration is happening in Canada. And our next speaker, Dr. Will Greaves from the University of Victoria, will actually talk a lot about this. So I won't spend too much time, but it's also just to highlight that. There's a lot we can learn from the global south. So that's a decolonial way of looking at it too. It's not just them learning from the north. There's so many resettlement and relocation situations in the global south that we can learn from and bring to Canada. So let's do policy transfer the other way. Let's do policy knowledge and just academic exchange and knowledge mobilization the other way. Now I've got quick questions about building back better, just in the sense of Whose experience matters when it comes to Build Back Better, whether in the South or North or anywhere? Whose future matters? Because I think that's really important. We're also talking about futures. We're not just talking about the right now. How do you balance a fire resiliency and climate proofing communities with survivors needs to be housed and returned home? So in the Philippines, it's very challenging because they got given a lot of concrete homes, which are very expensive to build, but are seen as typhoon proof. 
However, it's Philippines, those areas also experience earthquakes. And it's concrete homes who actually kill people in earthquakes. And while those homes are typhoon proof, they're also very hot. So whenever I've gone to a, a resettlement site, most people are sitting outside their homes because their concrete homes are actually quite hot during the day and there's poor ventilation. In the, in the case of Lynn, BC with fire resiliency, the communities are really upset because all of these fire resiliency and climate proofing um, bylaws and policies that are being put in place actually makes it harder and longer for them to rebuild their homes. And, and also the insurance companies don't pay for that. The insurance companies pay for the home that you lost, not the home that you want. So if we engage the government and we, again, go back to this idea of community consultation, maybe the government can have a $10,000, $20,000 gap to help people to say, you know, we will give you this extra money that the insurance companies won't to help to make sure that your home can be more resilient. So the, owners, the onus is not put on the victims who had just lost their homes. If they want to build a better home if they don't want to prevent the next fire. They have to do it themselves. And I think that's not fair. Again, so that goes to the question of who pays and for what? And then lastly, who decides? Because these top-down approaches have historically just not been great. Indigenous communities are disproportionately impacted. Just to highlight, in 2011, the government govern of Canada diverted water that was supposed to be threatening Winnipeg to Indigenous communities. So they physically diverted water that was meant to hit Winnipeg to Indigenous communities, because unfortunately the idea is that the Indigenous communities either don't have um, as much political power to complain or unfortunately just don't care. And we know this because in 2022, the Manitoba Court of the Queen's Bench actually ordered a settlement agreement of $85.5 million to anyone who owned real or personal property off a nearby Lake St. Martin in these Indigenous communities that got affected. So here is actual real responsibility that the government has to take for impacting Indigenous communities negatively. Now, we can have proactive solutions. We can have community-based plan relocation. We can have we can develop multi-year, multi-hazard prevention plans that move beyond party politics, especially in Canada. And we can develop multi-level governance and resources. When I was in the Philippines, we would ask them, like, have you heard about the government's uh, newest climate resilience framework, et cetera, et cetera? And they would say, I've heard about it, but I don't know how to implement it on a local level. Well, I don't know how to turn my local level uh, problems and put it back up. So there's a lot of disconnect between the different levels of governments. And then there's also a lack of awareness of the need to support and prepare host communities. There's a lot of focus on the actual displacement and not so much on what host communities can do and prepare and be warned about once people come. So we don't increase the xenophobia or the, or the hostility that might come with those new waves of people. And then lastly, and I'll finish, is that there are, again, unintended consequences to new solutions that we might be proposing. So the Summit for the Future, the PAC for the Future, the Climate Mobility Summit, they're all, they all have and are going to propose solutions, but they're way weaker on hard commitments and implementation mechanisms and accountability mechanisms that will push the political actors that have the power and the organizations that have the power to take any type of transformative action. So these are two quick examples and of potential future research agendas and potential future research for any PhD or master's student, which is electric cars are driving up critical mineral mining in the global south to the detriment of indigenous communities. Many people don't know this, but 69% of global mining projects are on indigenous and peasant land. And we're not looking at the fact that this demand in the global south for us to you know, clear our conscience of, of our carbon and our, for us to feel like we're working towards sustainability is actually causing global South countries to get rid of red tape, get rid of checks and balances when it comes to mining um, and do more mining and extract more at a faster rate to meet this demand at the detriment of indigenous, indigenous communities and other vulnerable communities. And there's toxins in their water, they are being displaced. Um, and of course they don't make any money off of any type of the money that is being millions, billions that are being, being made off electric cars. And then there's what I've mentioned in terms of climate change adaptation projects. So it's very common to propose positive things like climate change adaptation and not consider that there could be negative consequences. There could be unintended consequences. Uh, for example, like I mentioned, climate adaptation projects are often not evaluated. They take place, 
They have billions of dollars are spent uh, across various adaptation projects, but they're not evaluated. We don't consider the impact. Uh, and many communities are not even aware that some projects have taken place, but also they can lead to displacement and maladaptation. There are unintended consequences. A really quick example is shrimp farming. There's shrimp farming that takes place in Bangladesh and in Ghana and other places. And it's seen as very um, quick and cheap way for climate change adaptation because shrimp farming takes very little resources in terms of water, in terms of land, and the shrimp grow very fast and they're actually quite profitable. And they're seen as climate change adaptation because um, they're more resilient to the changes in weather and they're not uh, you're not dependent on large farmland and have crops really failing, etc. So you change to shrimp farming. The thing that people don't understand is that uh, instead of hiring hundreds of people as laborers, you only hire a few people. So you've got a bunch of people who now don't have jobs in agriculture as a result of shrimp farming. And most of those people are often women. And in Bangladesh specifically, they end up working in the garment factories that we have heard explode and uh, treat women poorly and are filled with toxins. So you got, you know, so if you actually move down the chain, there's actually so many unintended consequences that was started by this positive project of climate change adaptation. But we don't look at the consequences. We don't want to look at things uh, on, a, on a wider and bigger scale, then we miss all things in between. So this is why I argue that these new climate frontiers is actually everything in between right, that we need to actually focus on, because that's where a lot of the problems exist, but also it's where a lot of problems can amplify and cause new problems. And we shouldn't be blinded by this, these positive lenses that get put on electric cars or climate change adaptation. And with that, I think I am done. So please uh, email me, uh, follow me on Twitter. And I also got a really cool prof Instagram account. Thank you, Mom. that was so good. I learned a lot. You know, I, I mean, I'm your friend. We talk about this all the time and yet I didn't know so much. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I think this really sets um, the, the, the stage for the next few presentations and I'm quite excited for those as well. We're, while we're waiting for questions and since I'm the moderator, I will ask you the first question. Great. Um, <laughs> you know, I really love your slide on Build Back Better, mm -hmm. right? And I love those sub questions for whom, who decides. And these are questions that I've been grappling with, you know, as a, as a student who hasn't done field research yet. And I, we, you know, we've had two site visits in Malawi. I've been working in Malawi for like the last two years. And the question comes, uh, sure. Okay, let's, let's hope, you know, let's say we have come up with a equitable framework for Build Back Better. But how do we make that sustainable for the long run? Mm -hmm. Because you know, there are power dynamics, the feasibility issue that comes into play. In your experience, and you've had a lot of experience and you know, field work, what have you come across? What, what are some of the solutions that you have come across in that you know, sort of uh, stage, uh, topic? Sorry. So I would start by saying that, unfortunately, there's just no one framework. It's very context specific. So when I was in the Philippines recently, I got asked by a community member that, that is working in an NGO, volunteering his time. Um, and he asked, is like, so what is the ideal home to build after a disaster? And there just is no ideal home, right? Because I mentioned there could be the concrete homes, but depending on how multi-disaster or multi-hazardous your location is, uh, it might not be helpful for you. And also concrete homes are extremely expensive. So... It's very complicated and slightly controversial, but I would say that in some incidences, rebuild if you lived in a slum and your wooden home that you were able to build that's very short is demolished, that actually might be the easiest home to rebuild. One, because the reason it's so short, oops, the reason it's so short is because you don't own the ladders or you don't have the equipment to build more than your height. Right. And you don't and you don't have the money and the resources to re rebuild more than the scraps you find. So in some cases, that is actually the most resilient because you can build back faster. A lot of these communities that got to had to relocate um, waited five years, six years, 10 years, often in limbo, living in slums anyways. So it's a very complicated thing to tackle. And I think whenever we try to do kind of cookie cutter solutions, it has not worked. And I didn't get a chance to show this, but in our last trip to the Philippines, we also saw an abandoned resettlement site. 
it looked apocalyptic. I wanted to show it, but it'll take up too much time. But essentially, rows and rows of houses, and they were completely overgrown with grass and trees, and 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 and, and they they were equipped with like they were fully built, like there were bathrooms and like even like bedrooms, etc. And and slum so people didn't even slum there, and the reason was it was built too far away. It was built too far away. There were no amenities. Right, we had to drive drive, not just public transit, about 45 minutes to an hour outside of Tacloban, drive. So transit would be two hours or so, right? So it just wasn't, and it was not close to the other resettlement sites. It was this kind of weird ad hoc one that got built. But all this to say that that probably cost millions of dollars. And because yeah. a lack of consultation or a lot of a lack of foresight or just planning, it was completely yeah. abandoned. So that's millions of dollars that got wasted in homes that are not being used. No, that that's 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 pretty um you know that that that's scary how far you would have to actually travel. But you know, I mean as as a participatory research, you know, being involved in participatory research, um I often um come across the issue with um when you're applying for funding, you hmm. have to come up with these questions and objectives. As a student, I'm asking you as a student, you know, for advice. Where you're coming up with these questions and objectives, so you're already taking an outsider's view, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you have these beautifully crafted questions and objectives and methods, you can't really go in um, and ask, I mean, until you get the funding, because this is expensive, you can't really go in and ask what the communities want, mm -hmm. right? Of course, if you have already worked with the communities in the past, you had a long lasting relationship, that's different, right? So have you come across, have you have you done, and I know you apply for a lot of grants, from, from your perspective, like what could we do to do more authentic participatory research um, that, that we read about and that we uh, dream about doing, but yet there, we come across all these different limitations and restrictions? Well, it starts with what I've been asking in this new agenda is that we look at those spaces in between. As, as academics, they're already established. Right. So that we can create a literature for you to build off of. Mm -hmm. Right. So so the more established academics that have the networks, that have the know how, right, that have the rapport with local communities should do that harder work, which I know in a way sometimes doesn't match up with their um, career stage. But if they're mm -hmm. in the perfect situation to do that so that aspiring if, you know, students or PhD students who are about to enter the field can have the literature to build on. Right, because that is what's missing. Because it's very challenging to do on the uh, on the ground field work. It's very challenging to do more long term field work, and it's also very challenging to do work that is community led. We say this a lot, but actually listening to communities, actually having them dictate our research, is very challenging. It's very rare, and it's really hard to do, and it's not necessarily funded. So it is kind of like a chicken and egg situation, but I would call on more established academics to lead the way in building that foundation so that students can come along and help us fill the gaps and not feel like they're at the very beginning starting everything. We should be introducing them into networks, into communities where rapport is already established so they can do the harder work and the deeper work that, uh, that PhD students are actually well positioned to do because they can spend the time there. True, true, thank you for that. Um... People, please ask questions, you know. Um, I think no bites? No bites yet, but we'll keep, we'll continue. Uh, people are raising hands, okay. but please, yeah. please type in your questions uh, in the Q&A chat box. We have about seven minutes, I would say, before Francesco comes in and asks, uh, closes um, the session. But I'll ask you another question, um, and this might be, you know, one of those questions um, that uh, get a lot of heat, but... How do you define re resilience? I work with resilience and, you know, I had, I've heard critiques um, saying, you know, it's a bad thing, it's a good thing. Uh, but what, what do you think about resilience? You know? Yeah, I mean, resilience is a very challenging term because we get, we get told that resilience is good. But I think resilience is very uh, a Northern centric because resilience also assumes you have the resources to bounce back it assumes you have the resources to cope right and that's not necessarily true in many cases you don't have the the resources to be resilient and this pressure to be resilient actually contributes to 
further um, hazards or further vulnerability. And I'll highlight it through example. During my field research, I noticed because of Build Back Better, it was very common for people to think that they did have to improve their homes. And there's often through a second floor in which you can escape to. Because Typhoon Haiyan brought in uh, storm surge and flooding. So a lot of people told me harrowing stories of clinging on to electrical poles or climbing onto their roof and not, not being certain or share, sh sure that the water won't ri rise up that high. So many people got the idea that they could build a second floor. That was a great way in which to escape future uh, floods and storm surges. However, they don't know how to properly build a second floor. So what I saw was a lot of second floors made very poorly with tarp, with scrap metal, and with pieces of wood that was found. The issue with that is that those are the exact materials that would fly off in the next storm, in the next yeah. typhoon, and kill more people. So we've got a situation where we've got um, people saying that you need to build back better, you need to be resilient for the next disaster, right? But not having the resources, the funds, or the knowledge, because you can teach people how to build back better, but they don't. Yeah. Right. So then you get these second floors that end up being more hazardous and harming more people in future disasters. And I guess these are kind of the unintended questions. I mean, un unintended consequences that you were looking at, right, in your mining project, mm -hmm. um, right, from through the fund. Um, I think lastly, we have about four minutes and you can take your time. <laughs> um, Give us some um, sort of insights on how can we really mobilize this knowledge? You know, we're academics, we do a lot of research, but uh, I remember in my first year, we, uh, we I had a friend in, a, in the same cohort as me saying that, you know, we do tons and tons of research, but how much of this research is actually being used, actually reaches the decision makers, actually changes their behavior to make a change. I've worked in mining and it's it's difficult. You know, like there's a lot of uh, sort of uh, saying, I'll do this, I'll do that, you know, a lot of stamping going on, but nothing really uh, meaningful or or something that is actually for the communities and not just for greenwashing. And there is a possibility of that happening in, in this sector as well, you know, in, in climate displacement. So how do we stop that? How do we actually do work to change people, change decision makers' behavior, to want to do and want to do the right thing. I think just highlighting the fact that they're that we're aware of this, right? Because I think, especially when it comes to electric cars or Tesla, the brand is so strong that mm -hmm. it takes a lot to even get people to consider the the uh, environment's impacts of electric cars and of their batteries. And something else that's not really considered is, again, if we look down the line at other things, is that what happens when those batteries start to degrade? And you've got a car battery that's only 80% effective. You're not going to want to be driving around in that because it's going to blow up. So no. what we can do is we can repurpose it for other types of batteries. For example, giving them a second life and giving them homes. Mm -hmm. But there's other aspect which we don't consider is that it actually takes more energy to recycle a battery than to build a new one. Because at, at every critical a mineral, you know, dissolves or, or, or breaks apart at a certain heat. So it's actually so much effort. And then you have to pack it all back up, right? right. What I'm trying to say is that even just sharing this knowledge is really important. Uh, and, the, and the aspects of how it impacts the Global South is really important. And when I speak with those in the Global South, they're, they're, they really want their stories and their experiences to be heard because it's so overlooked, because corporate power is so strong. We know it's strong here, but it's even stronger in the Global South. So a lot of the work that we're doing is actually seen as high risk and dangerous because of, of how much censorship there is around these issues. So I think even just starting to highlight the challenges is an important first step, not just the research itself, but just acknowledging that what we're doing here when it comes to green um, initiatives or electric cars is having negative impact. And the more we pressure the fact that there needs these, they need to be more cars, Tesla needs to sell more cars, that we don't understand that it's actually driving more dangerous behavior in other places, in supply chains and, and companies. 
That's a, thank you. Thank you for that answer, actually. And, I, and I, you, I think York is taking a really good step with, you know, this creating this knowledge mobilization unit, mm -hmm. allowing students to actually go through an eight-week workshop, yes. which I'm thinking of doing. Because really, it's very hard. You know, sometimes yeah. you come up with these great plans, but the feasibility of the plan, how much you can actually do or implement, we don't understand unless we do it. So, yeah. so I encourage everyone to actually go and take this eight-week course. It's it's really good. Um, I believe we have come to the end of our session. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for everyone to everyone who attended. Um, and I learned a lot, and I'm sure the audience learned a lot too. Um, and I, and then I will invite Francesco to close um, the session, please. Thanks, now. Thank you so much. Um... Yeah, and just quickly, I just also want to say thank you so much to you, Dr. Sue, for that great presentation and um, kicking off this uh, dialogue series in such a wonderful way. Um, I definitely learned a lot from your presentation as well. as It was very interesting. So um, thank you so much. Um, th and thank you, Noah, as well, for your help um, with moderating this session and putting the session together um, and for leading the discussion with such uh, great questions. Um, and of course, thank you to everybody in the audience for taking the time to join us today and for being here. Um, we appreciate you um, joining us for our, for our series, and we hope to see you again in the next session. Um, and so I'm just going to quickly share my screen with the information for the next session. So this is a monthly series. Um, so it will be um, on Wednesday, October 23rd at the same time, 12 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and our speaker for that session will be Dr. Will Greaves, who is the Associate Professor of International Relations at the University of Victoria. Um, and he will be presenting on the topic of Beyond the Bed for the Night, the Limits of Humanitarianism for Responding to Domestic Climate Disasters. So um, if for all those who are uh, already connected, you will um, automatically receive reminders for this, series, or for this session um, a week before it starts. Um, but if this is of interest to anyone that may be in your networks, please feel free to share the page or the series information um, with anyone who might be interested. Registration is always open and free for this series. Um, and so with that, I'll stop sharing my screen. And just one last big thank you to everybody for taking the time to be here today. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you for organizing. Bye.